stories like that, how a color, an invention, have influenced the artist. So go back to the question I asked. And I would go to the Louvre every day to draw, and then across the street from the Louvre is the Sennelier store. Yeah. So I used to go in there, and I used to just like listen and absorb all these stories, and then I would walk over to the Musée d'Orsay, and then you could see, and you know, you see the pigment in these paintings, and it. I think as an artist, it's really moving to be part of something bigger than yourself. You know, I think we have this thing of like, I want to be a great artist or whatever, but when you really stand back and you think that you're part of such an incredible lineage and a history that's so much bigger than you. It just makes your your process and your practice a lot more meaningful. So I have a really personal relationship with Sonelli, and it was also when I really started painting all the time. So. And you paint a lot. I paint a lot. I wish I think we can probably pull up a picture of my palette. I sent Pierre some pictures. Yeah. I work on a palette that's this big. <laughs> it's a big window, actually. It's we'll a big we'll, we'll figure it out, and then. Uh, uh, and after, so then that. while that we're gonna figure it out, it'll take two minutes. And because it was very inspiring for me also to see Resha mixing the colors and giving me her feedback, uh, critique sometimes, because you know it's very important to us. That's how we started to make paint and getting the relationship with the painter. And that's what I continue to do to continue in America because now I feel like the Paris is no longer the capital of the art is more New York. Now it's starting to shift West Coast, to be honest with you, I, I can see that. Uh, so now it's my role to continue the family tradition and I engage. That's why I have this relationship with the Wayne Thibault, the David Hockney, the Richard Serra, the things. And today, the Reisha, because of course we try to teach you, to inspire you, to tell you, but it's as important to learn from you, you know, oh my God, your paint is too much like this, too much like that. So sometimes I explain the reason, but also, you know, style change, the, the world is changing. So I get your feedback and uh, come on, come back, come back. <laughs> no, because it's important. So I would go to your studio and you would squeeze it and say, oh, look how it mixes, it's great. And, but sometimes you would send me and say, oh, those are the, the color that are too much like this, or too much like that. You know? little, there's a couple colors that have a lot of oil in them. Yeah. So for instance, so I understand, you know, in France, the fact that it's too much oil is not a problem because it's a sign of, of quality because we don't use filler. We make the paint in a way that some colors, they separate, mm -hmm. but for American painters, it's a problem. They, they see that as a negative, or they, it's not convenient. Or so, so now I'm trying to, educate our chemists uh, you know, in France to see how can we, without compromise the quality, how can we get rid of that excess oil and th this kind of, of relationships. While we're on the subject, what do you do with that excess oil? If I open up a tube and I see a little pool of oil at the so top, do different. I try to mix it back in or I just get rid of it? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you my version, but I think it would be a good answer for Rachel because mm -hmm. there's two different things. I, I personally, I don't paint, I don't practice paint, but I practice the color, so I trace it. Mm -hmm. Personally, when I do it, I sort of, I take a a paper towel mm -hmm. and I get the extra and oil out, out yeah. and then squeeze oh, it. oil, you know, it's like oil and vinegar, you know, mm -hmm. some they don't mix, so you, you can grind it, but if they separate, you cannot easily bring them back together, so, yeah. you know, not in the tube, you can do it on the palette for using it, but you mm -hmm. cannot, you know, you can put it upside down, people have tried, it's very complicated, and if it happens in acrylic, it's a problem, acrylic shouldn't separate, so if it's uh, mm -hmm. with acrylic, be careful, there is something wrong. But while you're here, before we get that touch and feel, I promise in two minutes. Yeah, I wish oh, you could pull so up. many specific colors that I built such an emotional relationship to because they were so connected to history. So for me, you know, the French vermilion is such an amazing color because a lot of companies don't really make a vermilion that way anymore. There's either, you know, a cadmium orange or a cadmium red light. And I personally don't like cadmium orange. I think it's difficult, especially in the figure because it's so harsh that it's sort of overpowering but there's something really really beautiful about the French vermilion 
And then I would walk to the Musée d'Orsay, and you could just see it in these paintings. You walk through these rooms, and you see it, and it's so moving. And I love, Pierre knows this, I love Matisse. Matisse is one of my very favorite ah, painters. He's a god. So I think, you know, to see, like, his emerald green and to think that I'm using emerald green, just like he did, and just trying, you know, to make my own painting, it's just... More than more than just loving the pigment and how it how it moves on the canvas, I think it's so important for painters or artists to have an even even deeper deeper relationship with you know the meaning of, of the mediums that we're using and, and the tools and what it means to what it means to take this material manipulate it on the canvas and how that connects you to history. So yeah, there's definitely specific colors that I've used that I feel really just drawn to. Like it, fills me up so much inside, it makes me so excited. And he, I mean, he's that. having a lot what of paint. happened, and also with the, when I give lecture to the schools, I play a little game, what came first, the chicken or the eggs? And then the idea is, what came first? Is it the manufacturers, the, the stores that inspire the artist by giving them new colors? You know, in the 19th century, many colors were invented. Uh, you know, especially the blues, like before the blues, they were way too expensive. Lapis lazuli was the only real permanent blue that you, you could find, and it was a fortune, it was semi-precious stones. So in France, we, uh, Guimet invented the ultramarine, we'll call it the French ultramarine too. It's called French ultramarine to distinguish it from the ultramarine, which was lapis lazuli before. So, you know, but from the, Ultramarine to the cobalt blue to some of the vermilion, the cadmiums, the you know, a lot of uh, colors were invented. And so I do a little side track to your question. Did you ask me the question about the violet? So one of those colors to answer your question is manganese violet. That was invented in the later part of the 19th century. It, it, and Senelier, that doesn't matter whether it's Senelier or not, but one of the first ones to, to make it in tubes and make it available. So when Monet uh, discovered that color, it actually changed his palette. You know, before that, he had an old philosophy about certain colors he was using and only no black, no thing like that. And then he discovered that color, that violet, that pure, strong, mauve violet. There was different terminology for it. That came from manganese. Before you couldn't have that. Uh, you could only get those colors by mixing, and but it was not the same. When you mix, you, you lose some of the the strengths, the vibrancy, and all that. So when you that, he actually changed. All of a sudden, he started to use this violet, and he started that old theory of the complementary color with violet and yellow, and then it changed, and that's what I meant by that mm -hmm. contrast, you know, of, and he started the whole trend of the strengths of complementary color between violet and yellow, and he started to use violet more and more, at the beginning just to do shadows, but then after you can see how he's been using it too. So when he discovered, he changed his palette, so he was, an, you know, he was writing, talking about it's very strict palette, you know, the few colors, and then you discover a color, it changes everything. So that's <laughs> one of the stories. And like I said, we don't have a week, but there's many stories like that. All right, better. Thank you, everybody. So, Alfred Sisley. Then you have Edouard Manet. Closer. All right, then you have Pierre-Auguste Renoir, Camille Pissarro, um, Bert, oh, what's her first name? Bertha Morrison. Yeah. Morrison. Yeah. You know, Morrison. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I wanted to, to show women also, it was very important. Mm -hmm. Because often, when there is, I realized at the beginning when I was doing impressionist uh, presentation, it was only men, so I, I found some women. Uh, Emile Bernard. 
Oh, look, it, it's on the timer. Hmm. Interesting. So, uh, Claude Monet, Paul Cézanne, and I'll go back just for a second, I'll just give you a little thing, you know, to, to, after I'll tell you about this, look at this violet and the contrast to violet and yellow, and remind me to tell you about that later. Uh, Cézanne, very good friend of the family, Paul Cézanne was with whom we, we started, he was the first customer of the, so the, the, the relationship between Gustave Sennelier and, and Paul Cézanne was very strong. And you can see the colors, you know, how the, the colors have changed, you know, look at those, those red and orange, and that was uh, special. It was new, <coughs> basically. This is his uh, studio in Aix-en-Provence. This is uh, the Montagne Sainte Victoire, which is uh, uh, off, you know, the view from his, almost from his uh, atelier, from his studio up in Aix-en-Provence, and he's done a lot of these. Uh, uh, thing. And, and in fact, it, when I give, um, I show a couple of slides when I give classes in uh, academies or in uh, universities, art school, we try to look at the colors used at that time, the different pigments used. Because when I go to the museum with Mr. Senelier, with Dominique Senelier, we go to the museum and say, oh, this is the color that my grandfather made. <laughs> so that Paul Gauguin, that's in Brittany. Um, and then, you know, then after he went to Tahiti, it, the connection between the material and the, uh, and the artist, so this is was, uh, the guy, you can see the connection between the actual color of the pastels and the color of his pastel. Because we, we made, we created, Sennelier pastel was on the request of the guy, and the first colors were actually ordered by him. That's how he, he was a custom order. So this is other scene. And then he started, and I started to put more colors. And, uh, you know, I just realized if I don't touch it, it, it turns by itself. <laughs> so, uh, because one of the reasons he wanted to switch to pastels is because uh, it's very hard to use oil paint in the dance studio or in the, the opera house and all that. So that's why he was using similarly oils and then asked to do pastels so he can go there. This is uh, Pierre Bonnard's uh, palette. You know, you can see how, how he was keeping his paint. Uh, well, Modigliani was also a, a friend, but he was a little more wild and, and not mean, but he was a very special character, uh, but very talented. You know, in fact, uh, I go, when I go to Paris, I go to the Académie des Grandes Chaumières, where he was there, and I give talks there to Soutine. So Soutine, I think it's not as known here as it is in, in Europe, and it's very dramatic, it's very strong, and it corresponds to his personality. You know, as much as Pierre Bonnard was a very nice guy, Soutine was a tough guy. He was a little wild and crazy and, and pretty aggressive. So Delaunay, not very famous here, but he brought a lot to the uh, modern art. Uh, you know, the leap from representational to other, you know. Uh, this is uh, Chagall. Sorry, it's <laughs> cut a little bit uh, more well, but Chagall, you know, from Russia, but uh, came in Paris, you know. Paris was a magnet for artists all over the world. Paris was the capital of fine art, you know, the late 19th century, beginning of 20th century. So you had artists from all over the world, a lot of American as well. Dali, so funny, with double park, his wife would drive the Rolls Royce and with double park. <laughs> On the in front of the store, and with his, and he would just make an old show when he would come to the store. It was so funny. People, would, would, so that's uh, Marx Ernst, not as known as Dali, but to me, even more interesting as a surrealist than uh, than Dali. Um, so what do we have here? Ah, see, it comes. So Miro, you know, another f foreigner, uh, you know, coming from. Uh, uh, Spain also, I think, brought a lot uh, and did oil, but he also did pastel. For you, pastel artists, 
you know, especially are not as uh, as known. That's another mural. That's a pastel, in fact. Uh, and I think it's very interesting. He brought a lot because a lot of people see pastel very figurative, and is one of the first pastelists, um, artists that brought pastel in the more um, expressionist abstract. This is almost like a mixed media thing already. You know, he was playing with texture and mixing different things. Very, uh, very interesting. So this is, I believe, Kandinsky, most likely, I think. Um, also, you know, I think he came from the East, I forgot, Russia, or Poland, I forgot, uh, uh, living in Paris. And also, uh, you know, so Kandinsky again, also a Parisian by adoption. And uh, I think he, he brought a lot also to modern art. Uh, I think it is brilliant. And you can see how it's. Uh, so I guess I don't have to say his name. Uh, and I'll tell you particularly, he was close to the family as well, and I'll tell you a story, a major story about <coughs> Picasso and. Uh, and uh, so that was one part. Now I'll go. So this is. So here, the trick is. What do those all those artists have in common? Genius. Their paint. <laughs> yes, genius, and also self-serving. They were all yeah. hang out at the store, and they were all working with Sennelier. And uh, this is you can see when you go to the store. You know everything starts with pigments, and when you go to the store in Paris, you can find this is on the shelf up there. Those are the original pigment used by the grandfather that he found in the 19th century, and this is like um, an example of a cobalt blue uh, from the 19th century that you'll see that a cobalt blue today is mm -hmm. still exactly the same. Because it's uh, it, it all start with pigments. All start with actually making paint is just pure pigment. You have to start by having the best, the cleanest, the strongest pigment. And that's what Sennelier is very special because we have 600 colors of pastels. We have to really be very specific with our pigment. You cannot cheat with pastels. So this is an example of one of the places the uh, pigment comes from. This is uh, in the south of France, in Roussillon, and you can see the different strata of uh, the ochres, you know, the yellow and red ochre that we still today go there to pick it up. This is to give you, historically, this is probably the oldest Quarries with no, it's from Cyprus, and that's where you can see the iron oxide things, and that's where even the Egyptians uh, used to get their pigments. So that's the store. This photo is uh, 1900. I have another photo that shows you with the horse from 1880, but to be people like the, the car, and uh, you know, we were delivering in bicycle. That was the main, the first, the main grinder. And you can see the same guy here with the mustache on the left. That's in the early 1900. The first photo was in 1880, 90. This is in, a, uh, no, it was 1880. This, this one is uh, 1920. And with the first steam roller, <coughs> this is how they would actually tie up the tubes you know, because the old story about the tube, I'll tell you about that too in a second, uh, because that's very important. Uh, uh, design of the <laughs> tube, because what the first, the first tubes that you would be available, and that changed the world, you know, that changed the way artists could function, could go outside, you know, it really helped influence the impressionists. <coughs> so these were all the different size of tubes. And we'll see uh, later, I'll show you, I even have one. I'll show you uh, one of those tubes that I still have from uh, the 19th uh, century. And the paint is still good. <laughs> so I'll show you that. But uh, that's what he was. Before being a chemist, he was an illustrator. That was his job. He was designing catalog for art supply house. And then he went 
to take chemistry school at night. So this is just to show you how <coughs> the tubes were at the time. And you see the one on the left, well, that was the basic tube, it's quite big like this. That's, that's one of them I, I have, I'll show you later. Um, then, um, like I said, the, the tube, they were made out of uh, actual lead. You know, the tube were made out of lead, so they were very soft and a little fragile. Fragile, but uh, this is a set that's an oil paint set, and it's about big like this, mm. you know, like big like a pack of cigarettes. And that's how you would travel with. And it was very expensive. When you think oil paint is expensive now, then it was very, very expensive. So, again, to show you, that was um, that's a, a catalog also, you know, started to make sets to be able to travel with and. Uh, to discover this time you saw was the, the beginning of the railroad, so people could travel. This is an invention he made, but this one never, it's a patent of a way to, instead of tube, to have a, a can, but you press it so they, it doesn't oxidize, so it's like the top actually pushed down, but never made it, uh, it's never used, but it was, we had the patent for it. So. And this is today, the, the tubes today, which are made of aluminum. Um, so, uh, like I said, the tube was a big invention. It was actually invented in England in the beginning of the mid-19th mid century, but it got into artist hand only in the second part. Uh, just talk to you a little bit about brushes. One of also the revolution was the fact that you can see it was so, so proud to show a flat brush. That's also started in the 19th century because before all the brushes were round like that, you know, with quill, they were tied up, they were things. So the invention of the way, the industrial way to make ferrules change, you know, the, the brush and also that invited artists to be more bold, also that influenced the Impressionists. <coughs> when I refer to the Impressionists, I'm not obsessed with the Impressionists, just I use the Impressionists as the beginning of the modern art movement. Before, for centuries, everybody was stuck in the academic, classic academic side, so it was a true revolution, and the, the Impressionists spearheaded that, that thing, so that's the reason why I refer to it. But that was a brush factory in the 1900, not very sexy, but that's that's what it was. Uh, that was in Brittany. It's still in Brittany today. We still make the brush in, uh, in, in Brittany. So this is a catalog, uh, you know, uh, at the time. Renard and Gérard, they actually, Sauer Frère, they're still the family today. The Sauer Frère still own. They have the government since 1773, but this is actually called Raphael. It's in the second part of the 20th century, we start to brand it Raphael. So this is a brush, and I have a, I should have a sample. This is actually the first flat brush line, and we still have that exact brush. It's called Paris Classic, and it's copper ferrule with black and uh, with hog bristle, but hog bristle not interlock. This is the uh, a hog bristle that's we call it triple boil, you know, to make it soft. This is not talking about pastel, I'll show you something that doesn't exist anymore. That's a semi-hard pastel, semi-soft, see, demi-dur, uh, and those were sharpened by hand with a knife. You know, so you can imagine how much it would cost today if you had to buy those. So this is, and I'll expand on that story later, but this is the first oil pastel set that was the set of Picasso, and I'll tell you the the story about that. That was in the 40s, 1947 exactly. And then I'll, I'll tell you that's a kind of a fun story, but since I'm on a timer, well, I can stop and tell you now, but uh, I'll keep it for later. It's a fun story. And that was, um, that's the only real full artist quality oil pastels. So now we're going to another lecture, another thing, let's see what the, Surprise! Like I said, it's a little middle so I'm following the thing uh, that we show on the right is the oil pastels that uh, So this is uh, Picasso who came to the store, who actually 
did were doing little drawings right. in order to make sure it has the right consistency. And then you have to let it age. So every single batch, we go back with the hand, because with the hand you can feel, you know, how the, the, the grain, the texture, and then you compare in the back is the original color, and sometimes we go back 100 years and we compare the evolution. So today that's kind of how the, uh, the machine that puts the paint inside the tube. And um, I'm gonna have to make some better photo than that, I'm still have to, uh, this is oil pastels. <coughs> the oil pastels are made, you melt, you know, a mix of pigment, wax and mineral oil, and then you heat it, and then you pour it into those holes, and then after you put it in a freezer to, to make them uh, make that shape. You see they have those blocks, and those blocks go into a uh, cold uh, place, uh, some kind of a freezer. So they still have to be labeled by hand because, you know, the oil and it's so fragile that there is no machine who can actually label that. So when you label by hand, it's also a way to do quality control because you, every stick is, it's not hand rolled because it's in those things, but it's hand. Same thing with the soft pastel. The pastel, they go into a big vat, you know, it's just the pure pigment go down, and then just by gravity, the paste go there, and then you, you put it in those tray, and, and you break every pastel, and then it goes and dry like that for weeks, depending on the season, it can dry naturally for months, <coughs> as opposed to many of our competitors, they put it in ovens. But us, you know, that's one of the reasons they are so soft, because they are not baked, and there is no clay, it's pure pigment. That's why, in fact, it's pure pigment, that's why some colors are more brittle than others, because we don't use clay, we don't use filler, it's pure pigment, so what you feel is the true nature of the pigment because we always prioritize colors. People, artists, sometimes are confused. It's very delicate to put the, the label. People are confused, they think it's a quality control problem, but it's not. It's just because we believe color first. You know, pastel, it's better to have a pastel that breaks than to have a pastel who doesn't have the pure color. So this is the factory now in Brittany. It's a giant tube. Uh, so he moved from Paris to, to Brittany, uh, and that's, Brittany by the way, that's where my mother is from, and uh, we have, it just happened that I have a, a house and a family village. So this is Gustave, a portrait of Gustave Senelier in the, probably uh, still the 19th uh, century. And uh, this is, uh, this is him also, Gustave, a little later, probably. Uh, no, actually, before. Uh, looks younger now. Than, I mean, maybe they're not chronologic. I have to revisit that. But that's, with his, uh, that's the next generation. Is uh, Henry, his son, and uh, Juliette, with the mother, not Gustave's wife, and his. Uh, and, his, and their son there. This is uh, Henri Sennelier, the Dominic's father, the, the son. That's, it was like that when I met him in the early 80s. Uh, that's how I got some of the stories I tell you. Some of the story I knew that I had to tell his son, uh, him, Dominic. So Dominic is my uh, friend, my mentor. That's him who trusted us, I told you, when I was 21 years old in California, a hippie, and he trusted, you know, young wild hippie of California to to promote his brand, his family, to work, to represent his family. So that's his daughter now, the fourth generation, Sophie Senelier. So you see, finally, a woman who's going to be in charge, who's in charge, now is officially retired, but he's still at the store two or three times a week. This is at the uh, La, La Fiac, you know, very big art show, and we were asked to show a different color charts of all our different. So you have egg tempera, gouache, oil, watercolors, and things. So you, you see the um, the photo 
before the store, that's what it is today. That was taken a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's still the same cabinet, it's still the same, uh, uh, same like, I guess now there is brushes before they were elsewhere. So this is the stair to go upstairs, but I want to bring to your attention the colored, the colored charts on the right. Those were colored charts that were applied in 1900. And so today you have all the paint handmade, the touch, so you can see how the paints last. So whenever people tell you about light fastness or things, you know, we, we can see it live. You know, now it's 118 years after, after even a fire. You see, it's a little dark because there was a fire in the store, but we decided not to touch it. So that's the store today. You see, it hasn't changed much since the beginning. Uh, so actually the store was, uh, it was named Sennevier in 1880, but the store existed in starting uh, 1850, I think. So now another chapter, let's see what, what happens. You see, I, I'm totally improvising. I, I don't even know what's going to show up here. <laughs> but I'll, I'll tell you stories, don't worry. So, uh, ah, so this is, I, I show a few American and lady, this is Marie Cassatt, who was a good friend of uh, Degas, and in fact, Next month, I'm going to the National Gallery to do a talk because there is a uh, Degas offered a scenery set of pastels to Marie Cassatt, this one that you can see at the National Gallery. So I'm going to do a piece, I'm going to do an art venture about that because I have a new blog called Pierre. So this is a sergeant. You know, a lot of people, a lot of Americans would come to France in Paris at that time. And something very unique with sergeant is actually was totally in love with some colors of Sennelier, particularly in the watercolors, like a brown pink. He actually talks about it in one of his books, or a book about him. And uh, so he would go to Paris, especially to the Sennelier store for that particular color called uh, Steel de Grain, or translated brown pink. And, uh, and that's in Brittany. He would go to Paris and then go to Brittany, which I know. So. Uh, Whistler, so Whistler also spent a lot of time in Paris, and he had, you know, all life in Paris where actually he even taught, he had an atelier there, and he was, he was influenced by the Parisian, but he also influenced other people. So, uh, and that's uh, Paines, that's Edgar Paines. You know, same, you know, they were all attracted to Brittany. Brittany, that's where Gauguin was, and, you know, what happened is in summer, everything closes, like the school, the, the L'Ecole des Beaux-Arts closed, so they, in summer they had to go someplace, they would go to Brittany, because Brittany was cheaper than to stay in Paris. Man Ray, a, another American artist that spent a lot of time in Paris, and lived in Paris, and I think it's, it's very interesting, he brought a lot to the, uh, you know, uh, this is Jasper Jones, also, we don't know, he's, he's period in Paris, uh, but he was also uh, connected with, with the family. And uh, it's a trick, they, they hide the thing, I'm supposed to guess who they are. Oh, here, Jasper. <laughs> uh, so, he was very intrigued by Paris. So this, now we go with my friend. So this is Wayne Thibault, he's a personal friend of mine. When I first started in California, he was also one of my mentors. Uh, on, uh, I work with him closely. So he's, he's dear, in fact, I'm, I'm going to see him next week in Sacramento. David Hockney, that's also a friend of mine. And this is uh, the Grand Canyon, this is about 60 or 80 canvas as big like that, that we stretched. It's a special linen for art fix that we imported specially for him. And those reds were some of the, the reds and the, the violet were actually special Sennelier color, you know, the vermilion, there is some vermilion and there is the, uh, uh, the manganese violet and um, the Sennelier red, you know, the Ilios red. This is Chris Brown, this is also was the head of the department of UC Berkeley, and uh, that's his, his atelier in Berkeley, still in Berkeley, and I, 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 I like him. And, uh, 
that's uh, Peggy Crow. Crow, you know, also uh, impressionist, you know, plein air painter from Laguna Beach. There is still a very strong school of painter uh, that with whom I work, you know, so those are sort of, of my friends. And uh, that's Scott Burridge. Uh, also, so I don't know if, he, if those people are known in the East Coast, but they are mm -hmm. quite recognized on the West Coast. Uh, and uh, so that's New York. Uh, and also a very good friend of mine who, when I was doing pastels, I had two people totally different. I had the Wolf Korn on one hand and Daniel Green were my two pastel connections in, in, uh, in New York. And uh, they're both still alive. and. Uh, Older, but still, unfortunately, Wolf Khan doesn't see much. He has a very strong cataract, but uh, Dan Green is still around and very still painting a lot. Actually, Wolf Khan had just a show last. Uh, this is Vanessa Roth, also a very good personal friend of mine, who's uh, also the editor of Fine Art Connoisseur magazine, and. Uh, and she has some French origin, so she's she's a big big fan of Sennelier and Savoir Faire. So she's been very uh, helping. And then uh, that person, it's a lady. I forgot her name. I'll tell you. It's just less known, but I think she's very talented. Um, I can give you her name later. Also from that West Coast school of uh, impressionists, Deborah Hughes. Uh, again, same, you know, school of, uh, you know, sort of the American, contemporary uh, American Impressionist. Because uh, Ray Roberts is actually Peggy Kroll's husband. And you can see typical of Southern California uh, landscape. Um, so... Just to show you, you know how things in hundred years have <laughs> changed. But I'm just kidding. Um, this is uh, Calvin Young. I don't know if I pronounce it uh, same same thing. Uh, West Coast. Because uh, there is that big uh, uh, ah merci. <laughs> <laughs> I had so much more to tell you. So I guess that's it. Check. So it's a trick. You see, I didn't. I, I Did Sennelier also sort of set the standard as to how a canvas should be prepared even before it's painted on? But yes and no. So I just want to be, because I don't want to be to miss Lydia on one of the, through the family and the store. That's the other photo with the, the horse. You know, mm -hmm. It's even older photo than the one with the old car. I don't want to mislead you that Sennelier was the only one that invented all those oh, things. No. Yeah, yeah. But today is the only one le left. There is no other stores from the 19th century that still exist in Paris. And at the time, each store were also manufacturers. You know, it, it was you know there was not the separation of that. So your answer is yes and no. Yes, he, he participated in that. I cannot tell you he was the only. One who did it, who invented it, you know, it's very hard, especially when you go back in time, to to know exactly who was the first. You no, know, it just happened all at the same time. But lead, the white lead, was indeed in the 19th century that we were using white lead, and it was invented actually for cosmetic reason in England. Right. You know, to do uh, to put on your skin. Yeah. And it's oh, well. only after <laughs> dozens of years that we found yeah. out, they found out that some it's ladies were dying. Yeah. 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 But for, for but dozens of years, years, so that's how the white lead started. So it was not for painter, it was for if it's in hell. So as a primer, it's very, it's very dangerous if you stop, because often you sand it after you use it. So then you really have to be careful, have a mask, have this, and be extremely cautious, so we didn't want to take that chance. But as a paint, sometimes I wish we still make, you know, uh, some it's lead. It's a very different experience painting on the Yeah, because, you know, the consistency. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, it is. It knows. Yeah. So 
it uh, has a lot of quality to it and it keeps it moist longer, you know, so you, when you put the watercolors in your palette, you can re-wet it more, it lasts a little longer, some... Uh, so here you can do like this. Yeah, for Look how, how it's, you know, and it dries a little three dimensional. What are you showing us there? That's the sh shellac. Shellac based ink. And that's what's the one that Picasso was using on the slide. Do they mix well? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Hopefully. We have about, I think, 20 colors or so, 24 colors. And I have brushes, you know, for, for the shop. So here, people can play with that. Uh, so here, oil pastel. So here we have a corner with oil paint, another corner with ink and watercolor, and then. Uh, this is oil pastel. No, this is soft pastel. That's to show you what a pure pigment does. And so, this is the. Thing. So you can play with that, then I'll show you the same thing with oil pastel. Oil pastel must be framed under glass. Uh, so you, can, so uh, it's, you have to think of it, because it's going to work from here. Yeah. Yeah. But then yeah. it's a okay. movement like yeah. this, so, so well, what do you're you working like this. Yeah. So you're working on large surfaces. You know, New Jersey, where you can oh, find it, it's like surfaces. New Jersey, yeah. yeah. out there. Yeah. 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 You know, you're working now. Oh, Steve. Alan Sheff is a very, very interesting part of that. And then you're yeah, just holding the thin part. Right. Right. Tell him, yeah, take the cast, tell him, I sent you. And you know who loves that? Do oh, no. The watercolor. His office is really in San Francisco. Who was one of the brushes? Yeah. Yeah. So me, I wanted the brush. Um, so the brush? Yeah, so just move out of the way. You know, I tell you, you know who loves the brush? You feel... Max Gaines. So I don't know where the calculator is. It's the number one brush. I gotta find it. Where is it? So where do you leave? Where do you leave? Very fast, very quickly. So it's... But you have to have the right touch. So yeah. holding it with a really rough, yeah. heavy... The A.I. Friedman mm -hmm. yeah. over there. You Otherwise, can be very forthwith with it because it can handle it, but you can also and be very, very classic delicate. Paris Classic from Raphael. So oh. Raphael, oh. Paris Classic. Oh. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> but I mean, all of a sudden, like a 10 foot no, brush, I don't talk about it, but it when you have something like this, I, 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 I work like, so I have worked like usually like yeah, seven so feet, yeah, and yeah, none of the brushes right. do anything. Yeah. Yeah. But if you have something yeah. like this, then you can start doing something. I can't see anymore. But you can see just by using the way you use the brush, uh, the control of it, uh, it really responds well. But you have to get used to holding it. Yeah, and part of it is standing while you're painting. Yeah. I think nine oh, times yes. out of ten, and did you, you get you know that a, you get so much more out of it because you're using your the image is coming up from your feet yeah. to you. Yeah. 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 I trust you. Yeah. Just it's sorry. Really, it becomes like an activity. I get money. I put my It's like going to the gym. Only you don't well, have. Well, yeah, it is. It is. It's almost like an athletic enterprise. Right. Right. Exactly. So yeah, that's why I found the other smaller other traditional. It depends on what you want. It's gorgeous. Yeah. And this is the... That's a vermilion. So even though I don't have watercolor, I think I should do a little bit.